This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. And I don't know why I feel an unction of the Holy Spirit to just say this to some individuals that are in this place today. I don't know why I'm discerning this so strongly. But it is one thing for us to receive the grace and the mercy of God, to, for God to forgive us, knowing that He has forgiven us. But there are some people under the sound of my voice today that are holding themselves hostage. You've got a problem forgiving yourself. Over stuff that happened that you did, you had some hand in it and you took full responsibility of bad things and negative things that may have happened and sometimes because, well, had I done this, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Maybe had I not done this, maybe this would have happened. And you've dealt with a blame and you've had faith to believe that God could forgive you, but you have held yourself in unforgiveness. And I just remind you today by the word of the Lord, don't make yourself greater than God. By His grace, as God forgives you, there's a power in you. And I'm hearing the word of the Lord while I'm talking to you. I hear the word of the Lord in Psalm 103. And I just want you to hear His word is so real. This is unplanned and unrehearsed. Psalm 103 in verse 10 says this, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And if he has moved it and didn't judge you as if he moved it, as far as the east is from the west, you ask him to give you the grace. And it just reminds me, Psalm 103, just toward the beginning of the chapter, I'm just telling you there's something healing and therapeutic in God's Word that is a right now word. This is a rhema word. Well, the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Even when you're feeling like dirt, bless him. Bless the Lord. And it says, and forget not all of his benefits, who pardons all of your iniquity. He pardons it. You've been, you've received like, that's higher than a presidential pardon. And who heals all of your diseases. Because when you carry this unforgiveness, it's making you sick. It's making you depressed. It's giving you neurological disorders and digestive disorders. He pardons your iniquity. He heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, tender mercies, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Some of you, your life has been on hold, but God is getting ready to peel back your years. New life, you got to be able to forgive yourself. It happened, it happened, accept that it happened, and ask God, ask Him for the grace to say, Lord, even while I was stupid and while I was foolish and while I, I broke my mama's heart or my daddy's heart, while I did shameful things to my family, Jesus has washed you and has cleansed you and has sanctified you and he has moved that thing as far as the east is from the west. And he says, I, I forgive you, now you forgive you. You forgive you, you turn it over to him. You accept your responsibility in it all. That maybe it could have been done a different way, but Lord, I bring you my failures, I bring you my faults, I lay it on the altar, Jesus. 
and I, I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for failing to forgive myself after you had released me of the duty. You gave me a presidential pardon, and I went and put myself back in the prison of it all. But today, God lifts this thing off of you. And many of you are going to sleep tonight with a peaceful sleep that you haven't had in a long time. The Holy Ghost gave me the wisdom some years ago to just stop asking people, how are you doing? And to ask this question, how are you sleeping? Because when you're not doing well, you don't sleep well. And the things that eat at you in your own soul, that Jesus is trying to heal some of you off today. My, he sent his word, Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions, the very thing that was destroying them. He wanted to deliver you of it. And some of you about, what if I coulda, woulda, shoulda? It's not about what you coulda, woulda, shoulda, it's what he has already done. By his own power, by his own blood, rest in the finished work of Jesus. Rest in his grace, rest in his compassion, rest in the fact that God knew everything that there was to know about it, and he has removed from you the guilt of that. You have been pardoned by God himself. You are pardoned by God himself. Maybe it could have turned out differently, but you've been pardoned, and God will take everything that's been left from that. He specializes in coming in in the brokenness of our human life and allows us sometimes to have the light of his beauty shine into us, that we are beautifully broken. And God puts us back together again. He puts us back together again. You will never hear God asking, why was he so stupid? Why was she so stupid? You hear him say, I've separated this thing from them as far as the east is from the west. And he takes the sting out of it. He takes the shame out of it. Guilt is over what you did. Shame is over who you are. And God says, you are my beloved. And God has now made you those that can tell others about the grace after you've received it in your own heart, not merely from God, but by, it is your way of saying, God, I believe what you did for me because now I'm going to do for me what you did for me and release myself out of this prison of guilt that I've been holding myself be at peace with that. Consecrate that thing to God and exhale and just say, Lord, I release myself now from everything that I have held against myself. I turn this thing over to you, to your power, to your blood. That as you removed it from your mind and heart, now God, now I give it to you that you might clear this out of my life and wholeness might fill me once again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I hope that you appreciate that you've got a bishop here that listens to the Holy Ghost. I believe in the prophetic power of the Word of God because God wants us right with Him and He wants you to be at peace. He came to set the captives free. And he was just letting you know that some of you have been locked in a cell behind an open door of what you, you've already got the key. And he's going to have you to take that key now and unlock yourself and now go and use the key to unlock some other folks. Because the devil has been trying to whip you over stuff that you did back then that is already under the blood and it is separated as far as the east is from the west. And if you don't know anything about direction and, and a compass, the east and the west never meet. And so God said, that stuff that you did back there, I've forgotten about. And that your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. I'm finished with it. You be finished with it. Now you tell people what marvelous thing the Lord has done. Tell him what he took off of you. Tell him how you dropped the guilt. Tell him how he took away the shame. Tell him how he brought healing into your soul. Tell you ought to testify.
testify and let somebody know Jesus healed me on the inside he healed me I kept beating myself up over what I did I beat myself up over the abortion over the abuse over the molestation over the neglect over the abandonment I kept hurting myself <laughs> Jesus said, with everything that you've done, he said, I still love you. I still love you. I still love you. You weren't able to send yourself out of God's reach. He still loves you. He still cares for you. You're still the apple of his eye. He still finds you to be lovely and graceful and merciful. He still finds something in you in which he takes delight because God says, I know the plans that I have for you. He still did not remove his call from you just because you messed up. Hey, Ah, there is a healing river. There's a healing river. There's a healing river. Some of you are right now getting uh, the Holy Ghost as your divine therapist. And peace, peace like a river is flowing. Peace like a river because there's been a storm on the inside. It's crazy when it's storming on the inside and the sun is shining out there. But it's a cloud that's been here. And I see the cloud is moving. There's an internal cloud. The Holy Ghost is blowing that dark cloud. Guilt and shame and insecurity. And what if and coulda, woulda, shoulda. And he's just shifting all of that out of you. And he's bringing you a place where God wants to heal your soul by there's something that is done by the power of Jesus. May he give you a revelation of his grace and his goodness because the devil keeps trying to make you feel that this is you, this is you, this is you. And he is the culprit. He's the one that put the thought in your mind and made you start feeling guilty all over again over what God has already called finished. And we do desperate to the Holy Spirit when we ask God to do again what he has already called finished. He loves you. It's the bottom line. He loves you. He loves you. Not only does he love you, you are accepted in the beloved right now. Not one day when did you get it all together, but right now, right now. Right now, you're accepted in the beloved of God right now, right now, right now. You're accepted in the beloved of God right now, right now, right now, right now. I see a sunshine breaking out from the inside. Some of you have been seeking the light, but God's You've been seeking the limelight, but God's putting a light on the inside of you that's going to shine out. Remember, the Word says, let your light shine. Yes. The devil has put a blanket over your light Hallelujah. of guilt, self-condemnation, not from him. God convicts the, whole, the, the devil condemns. Conviction is a move of the Holy Ghost for you to get right. Condemnation is you're punishing yourself over and over for the wrong that you've done. God never deals in condemnation. He only deals in conviction. And that conviction that God brings moves us to get right. There's a healing that he's bringing on the inside. Wrap your arms around yourself right now. And just say, Lord, Thank you for loving me and for forgiving me like no one else can. And now exhale. 
now I forgive myself. I let it go. I release every negative emotion, every hurtful memory, every self-debilitating thought. And I receive your peace in my soul. Shine, Lord Jesus, from now on. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody's got an early Christmas. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 No matter what happened, just sometimes I'm telling you, when you can't change your situation and your circumstance, I heard the Lord said, change your position. The very one that said that he teaches my hands to war because you're always doing something with your hand all, all day. You're using your hands to cook, you're using your hand to do hair, you're using your hand to drive uh, vehicles, you're using your hands to write, you're using them to type for computers, you're using them to text, you're using your hands all the time to clean, you're using your hands to do things. And God says, now when you come into my presence, I want you to do something different with your hands that you don't normally do in everyday activities. You lift your hands. We lift our hands in the sanctuary. We worship him with hands lifted up. And I'm telling you, because something, something that's down on the inside of you, when you lift your hands up, something comes up in you when you change your posture. Something comes up in your disposition. Something comes up in your mind. Something comes up in your hope. Something comes up in your aspiration. Something begins to come up. Because we don't, we don't, we don't do this to anybody else. But when my hands are lifted toward Father, I stretch my hands to Thee. I stretch my hands to Thee. I stretch my hands to Thee. It is a posture of, of, of receiving. It is a posture of pick me up, Jesus. Pick me up, Jesus. Pick me up, Jesus. When a little baby wants to be picked up, they put their hands in a motion. Pick me up, Jesus. Pick me up. 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 May he just bring you into this place the way you use these hands to worship him. Worship him, worship him. Just with your hands, you give him a wave offering. You worship him with hands uplifted. Your spirit will get lifted. It's hard to stay down while your hands are up. It's hard to stay down while your hands are up. It's hard to stay down while your hands are up. Baby, my soul of my, I declare in the name of Jesus, sometimes to just walk with your hands up. Walk with your hands up. Walk with your hands up. Whoever knew that when you stepped in here today, it was going to be a Holy Ghost stick up. That where God says, give up your way. Give up your will. Give it up. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My, he loves when we surrender to him. Nothing else says, Lord, I surrender to you that our hands lifted up. You didn't realize that you could pray just with your hands. Sometimes life will hit you so hard, it'll knock the wind out of you so deeply that all that you can do is lift your hands up to him. 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 And it becomes a holy sacrifice. This becomes a holy sacrifice where God will say, I'm going to get it. I'm going to give it to them now. They're in position. They are in that position of surrender. They're surrendering to, the, to me now. They're surrendering. They're surrendering their will. They're surrendering their way. They're surrendering their dreams and their ambition. They're surrendering. They're surrendering everything that has been lost. They're surrendering the hurt. They're surrendering the drama. They are surrendering the trauma. They're surrendering it right now. They're surrendering it. They're surrendering. Surrender to Jesus. 
Mama! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for lifting your people, God. Thank you. Thank you for changing our posture, our position. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. Tell somebody I needed that. I needed that. I needed that. I needed that. Uh, are you glad that he's in the building? We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. He's awesome in glory and in power. We serve an awesome, awesome, awesome God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, take your seat if you can. Take your seat if we can. We're going to, we'll give you a speed course today in our regular lesson. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29. Notice the words of Jesus, and he was saying the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up daily, and the seed sprouts and grows how he himself does not know. The soil produces crop by itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Now when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. We're talking for a few moments about the power of discipline, the power of discipline. And this is where Jesus is talking to an agricultural audience and he had just gone over the parable of the sower and the seed. And now he's drilling down in verse 26 through 29 about the parable of the seed in a more specific way about planting and just being faithful to plant it night and day, go to bed and get up and the seed comes up on its own. It comes up on its own. It's not anything that we do that makes it come up. It's that it comes up on its own because God is working underneath the surface of some things where you cannot see, where it looks like everything has fallen to pieces, but God says, I'm working underneath this thing. One sows, another one waters, but God gives the increase. We are not responsible for the increase. We are not responsible for the growth coming up. We are not responsible when a seed goes in the ground, how that thing begins to crack and, and it begins to become discombobulated and it disembowels while it is underneath the soil and then shoots begin to come out of it. We have nothing to do with that. The farmer who sows the seed, who uh, sows that thing day in and day out, they, they don't even understand how it works. They just know that it works. And they know when I do this, this happens. And, and it's God's way of saying he doesn't even know, but they just rest in the discipline of doing what you need to do every day, then going to bed and getting up. You go down and then you get up. Every time you fall down, you get back up. Every time you lay down, you get back up. That's called resilience. It takes discipline to be resilient, to say, you know what, they told me no this time, but I'm coming back. Yeah. Salesmanship does not begin until the customer says no. It says, I'm coming back again. There were people that will say no to you. No, no. When I got ready to build, I reached out to banks that told me no, flat out. No. And it, it, it's something that after we got up and started doing pretty well, then I got letters <laughs> inviting me to take out a loan with them. And, and I've never been one to use profanity, but <laughs> some, some words came to, to my mind that I wanted to point to some people that I know to express what I was thinking. But I encourage you to just be faithful, disciplined in, in sowing the seeds. Always sow good seeds. You don't know whether the good seeds that you are sowing, your children, your grandchildren, your niece, your nephews may reap sometimes because you will sometimes sow into fields out of which you don't personally reap. 
in the same way that sometimes you will reap out of fields in which you never sowed. I acknowledge that there are blessings that are in my life that didn't come based on what I did. It was on, based on what somebody did before me. And I'm deeply grateful to God. But I, I tell you in the words of Elizabeth Elliot, who said, don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. Don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. Don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. I like to say here that discipline is our safeguard. It's a safeguard from overindulgence. When you think about discipline, discipline means not eating all you want to eat, not staying up all night, not sleeping all day, remaining consistent when you don't feel like it, and leaving room for God to show up in unique ways in your life. That's discipline. That's discipline. Don't, don't do all that you want. It's discipline. It's discipline. Not giving up when you don't feel like it. It's, it's, you, you'll never be consistent if you walk by your feelings because some days you don't feel like it. Some days you don't feel like cooking. Some days you don't feel like getting up and taking the dog out. And there are things that we have to do even when we don't feel like it. That's called discipline. Sometimes we have to pray when you don't feel like praying. You have to read the Bible when you don't feel like reading the Bible. You have to do certain things when you don't feel like doing it. If you live by your feelings, you will always be defeated. The devil will run rushed over you when you live by your feelings. We're not called to live by our feelings. We're called to live by faith. We walk by faith. We, the goal is not only to walk by faith, it is to live by faith. And then you will discover that as discipline begins to grow in you, it builds over time. Discipline builds character. Discipline builds resilience. And discipline builds self-confidence. These are some of the fruits uh, of, of discipline. When you're disciplined in your life, it builds character. It builds resilience, and it builds self-confidence. And I'll just tell you this. You will either know the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. It's going to be one of them. You will either know the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The pain of discipline says, I'm going to do it now. If I do it now, if I pay now, I can play later. But if I play now, I'm going to have to pay a lot more later, a lot more. But may I say to you that one of the reasons that some people don't have discipline in their life is ultimately because they don't have a vision. Discipline is really only necessary when you're working on something. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. I want you to notice that. They run wild when they don't accept divine guidance. The King James Version says it like this, where there is no vision, the people perish. They are destroyed or they cast off restraint. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. And see, some people have sold us the bill of goods that if you obey the law, you're going to be miserable. You're going to feel like you're in bondage. No, no, no. When people do not accept divine guidance or where there is no open vision, then the people run wild. They cast off restraints. They, they begin to wild out and turn up when they don't have a vision. When people have a vision and they are working on something, you show what you're waiting for by showing what you're working for. So when I've got a vision, my vision disciplines me. My vision makes me get in the bed at a certain time or get up at a certain time. My vision says, you're not going to spend money on this. But if I didn't have any, any, any vision, drinks on me for everybody. <laughs> but when you're working on something and you're going to need that money to fund your vision, you need discipline to say, I'm not picking that check up. Whereas you used to be the baller, but it is discipline when you've got a vision. So if you see young people wilding out, don't attack them for wilding out. Walk them into atmospheres that, that stimulate vision. Everything happens in an atmosphere. 
And it is not until you've been exposed to the right thing that turns the light on the inside of you and you can see yourself in the future down there doing this. I'm telling you, there's nothing more empowering than to be in an atmosphere that starts you to dream in. When you get in an atmosphere and you start seeing something, if God has to reveal it to you while you're asleep, but when you got a dream and a vision that you're working on, it imposes a discipline on you. I mean, when you know that you're going to do this, there are certain things that you can't be involved in. It's like, no, dude, I'm going to go to jail for you. I got some stuff that I'm working on now. It's your vision that'll stop your foolishness. And if you let your mind run back to the, every time that you were living wild without any restraint, it's because you had no vision in your, in your, in your, in your view. You, you saw nothing. And so when you don't see anything that you're working toward, it makes you wild in your present if you can't see anything in your future. And so when you begin to have faith, it's not even about the present, it's really about the future. It's about what's waiting for me down here. And as, as long as I've got, I don't mess that up, but I see this, this is what's waiting on me. It takes discipline to be able to hold yourself. And so don't attack people for running wild. Walk them into atmospheres that will generate or stimulate a vision and show them something in the realm of possibilities. It's not until they start dreaming and get a vision that a discipline comes into their life. There are certain things that you don't want to be messed up with when you're working on something. I mean, that's one thing about it. When people become highly successful, they are highly focused, and they don't let foolishness throw them off. Now, sometimes when they get there and the vision is fulfilled, they start doing stupid stuff, <laughs> wilding out all over again. You need a new vision. You need a new vision. You need a new vision. You need to always keep a vision in front of you because where there is no vision, no open revelation, no divine guidance. If there's no divine guidance in your life, that's why you need to always stay connected to a prophetic voice somewhere. Where there's no prophetic voice in your life, you will run wild. Your life will run wild. And then I love this verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and, uh, and the 13. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. you see, this is, this is a parent's heart. He says, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. When parents are with, you know, the children are with you, you know, you, you, you did all right while, while you were with me. He said, but now that I'm away, it's even more important now that you behave yourself while I'm gone. And notice what he says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you. Notice this, God is working in you. This is, this is a... This is a father speaking to a church at, Phil at, at uh, Philippi, reminding you God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. How are you going to do what pleases God if you don't even have the desire to do it? God has to work in you, giving you the desire and the power. God not only gives you the desire, he gives you the power to do what pleases him. So he says, listen, I know you obeyed me while... I while I was there, but now it's even more important that you obey in my absence. He says, work hard to show the result of your salvation. It's not to get saved, but to show the result of your salvation, obeying God with a deep reverence and fear. There's something about fearing God that unleashes the hands of the Holy Spirit to work in your life in brand new dimensions. It really is. And I would say this, that through prayer and Bible study and serving others, and healthy Christian fellowship, we posture our lives in ways that make room for God's Spirit to transform us. Just through some of these practical disciplines of life. And right now, in the spiritual life of people, people are just like, well, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to be involved in a church, but I'm spiritual. <laughs> if you are spiritual, what are the sacraments of your spirituality? Where is the performance of the sacred? Where is that that brings in the reverential fear of God into your life? Where is that thing that becomes a sacrament in your life? Christianity leads us into divine sacraments, which is a tangible thing in our life that reminds us of the spiritual. A sacrament 
is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. Sacraments make grace tangible, revealing God's presence in our material world. Just think about that. This is what sacraments, we just partook of, of, of a sacrament of grape juice and, 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 and the bread that, that represents the blood and the body of Jesus, we, a physical thing that we put into our bodies that connects us in a tangible, visible way with the invisible grace that has saved us and redeemed us. We know that it's not the grape juice and, and that styrofoam-tasting cracker. but it is a physical, tangible sign that he bled for me, that his body was pierced for my healing, that he was beaten with his stripes, I am. That reminds me of something here that happened in here with him. It is a visible expression of an invisible grace of God. And I'll be the first to tell you that spiritual disciplines alone can do nothing but they can get us to the place where something can be done. Because see, you can just go, any, any old heathen can get a sacrament and go through the motion. So spiritual disciplines alone can do nothing, but they can get us to a place where something can be done. It turns our attention to the holy. It brings a reverential fear. It brings feelings of thanksgiving into our hearts. It sets our affections on things above. And let me just say this to you. We grow spiritually in Christ much more by doing it wrong than we do by doing it right. God teaches us much more when we do it wrong as opposed to our doing it right. We learn about his grace, about his mercy when we do it wrong than when we do it right. If you never had a problem, you wouldn't know that God could solve it. You wouldn't know what faith in his word would do. You wouldn't understand grace. You couldn't sing the song of the redeemed if he didn't have to redeem you from some of your foolishness. So it is because of our wrongdoing that we learn God in deeper measures. I love the words of Bernard, uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw. He said, a life spent making mistakes is not only more honorable, but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. So do something, because it's easy to correct something, but you cannot correct nothing. I want you to notice 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Don't try, train. Train yourself to be godly. You don't try to go for the goal in the Olympics. You train for it. He said, rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both present life and the life to come. You will discover that discipline involves consistency. It it, it discovers, it, it involves consistency, which is following through with actions repeatedly over time. It involves focus, which is prioritizing tasks and goals despite distractions, and it involves accountability, that is taking responsibility for one's actions. I love the words of Warren Buffett. He said that we don't have to be smarter than the rest. We have to be more disciplined than the rest. If you're working on something with greatness, you've got to be able to be more disciplined than other folks. And I I, I, I would say this to you, that the greatest form of self-love is self-discipline. When you really love yourself, you don't contaminate yourself with, with drugs. Oftentimes, drugs is trying to anesthetize a pain that ends up doing more damage because it has side effects. And while you were trying to numb this pain, you were creating another issue in your health down the road. And when you love yourself, you don't injure yourself. And sometimes it's about being healed by God so we stop hurting ourselves trying to help ourselves and receive the help that he has already provided for us. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11 says this, that fools vent their anger, but the wise quickly hold it back. Touch your neighbor, say, I know that person. I know that person. (laughs) Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back and tell them, I'm telling you this, it takes more strength to hold it back than it does to let it go. 
It really does. It takes more strength to hold it back than to let it go. And so I would say to you, respect yourself. I want this half of the room over here to just say, respect yourself. And this one over here said, hold your tongue. Come on, let's try it. Respect yourself. Hold your tongue. Respect yourself. Hold your tongue. Respect yourself. Hold your tongue. You'll be surprised how much dignity can come to you when you are able to restrain your tongue because the tongue is a deadly evil. And we've got so many people being damaged by this little thing that's in the mouth that people don't hold. And there's so much that can, uh, healing and therapy, that when you respect yourself, not to just let everything come out of your mouth that comes to your mind, because the devil will plant a thought, and then you become his vessel when you speak that thought. Respect yourself, hold your tongue. I wish somebody who knows how to do something with beats would take that and work something and send it to me. I know we got some talented young people that know how to feel beats and they can use their own God-given creativity. That's why we need gifts. We need the gifts of God for people from all walks of life to be able to take godly principles, to take God's Word and put it in something that the world can receive and send it out and shift a culture. Mind that would bless my life like nobody's business. I'm just telling you, it's, it's an amazing thing when God begins to do something in us in a huge way. And I would say this, because the devil is so tricky, he is a master deceiver. The devil is tricky, he's a deceiver. Because here's the reality. Whenever you're on your journey toward heaven, when you're on the road to heaven, it feels like hell. But when you're on your road to hell, it feels like heaven. Can you see how the devil is? He makes you really think that you've got something when it feels so good on the road to hell and it feels like heaven until it doesn't. And then when you're on your road to heaven trying to do things the right way, it feels like hell. Because when you're walking with the devil, you get no opposition from the devil. But the moment that you make an about face, and go from east to west, now you got the winds, the contrary winds coming against your life. And while you're walking toward heaven, it feels like hell because hell is coming against you, trying to make you feel that you're disqualified from ever getting to heaven. And so when you're pursuing the road to righteousness and godliness, it feels like hell. But when you're doing all of the devilish stuff, all of the wicked stuff, all of the evil stuff, all of the sensual stuff, all of, it feels like heaven. It feels so good. And that's why they can't quit it. They're in love with a good feeling. If it feels good, you will want to do it again and again and again. They're chasing a feeling that feels like heaven, but it leads to hell. You better ask the question, where does this lead? Where does this lead? Not how does it feel, but where does this lead? The person that the devil will send into your life will make you feel like heaven, but they will bring hell into your life. I know some of you know them and have broken up with them and divorced them and gotten back and forth and been around the block and put them off one time and got them back on because you were enjoying the journey. It felt so good, but it was leading to a terrible place. And then when you're doing the right thing, it feels so hard, it feels like hell, but it's leading you to heaven. Things are not as they appear. That's why you need the discerning of God, and I pray that you will ask his discernment in your life. I hope you got something out of the word of the Lord today. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bow your heads. If you'll just give us a few more minutes, just our reverence of God. It's our way of just creating space to say, God, I want to I wanna make room for you right now. I make room for you to just wait in your presence because somebody needs to make a decision for Jesus today. And I want to give you that opportunity, somebody who you thought you were doing pretty good. Things were feeling good, but you don't really know where it's leading. And today, if you're out of fellowship with God, 
And you realize you're not here by accident, coincident, nor chance. God had you to be here today to experience everything that you've experienced. He loves you. He cares for you. Nobody drowns because they fall into the water. They drown because they stay there. Some of you, you've been dog paddling a long time, but you're getting tired now. Your legs are getting tired. You're running out of breath. You realize, I can't do this forever. And you realize, some of you came here today with this on your prayer, Lord, something has got to change. Something has got to change. Something has got to change. If you know that something has got to change, and you're willing to make that change today and ask God's power in helping you to give you not only the desire, but the power. I want you to stand to your feet and make your way here to this altar while heads are bowed. Just get up out of your seat and come down here. Meet me at this altar. You realize, God, I need you. I need you. I don't want to leave this place the same way that I came in Jesus' name. I don't want to leave the same way I came in Jesus' name. Thank God for our brother that's leading the way. That's, that's, that's a leader. Come on, come on, come on and get right with God today. Come on. Come on and get right with God. Come on. This is the most noble thing. This, this is not shame. This is glory. It's rejoicing time when folks come, come home. When a heart turns toward him and repents, it's... This is glory time. Come, 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 come. Thank you for your honor and your respect of the house of the Lord. Come, come, come. God is up to something. God is up to something, and we trust him with our very lives today. God is up to something. We don't have any games. This is not about gimmicks. This is the real deal here with a real Savior that comes in, and, and he undergirds us, and he walks with us in the midst of our pain. He comes into your pain. He comes into your confusion and brings clarity. He comes into your darkness and brings light. He comes into your sickness. He comes there with his presence and his power and infuses you with the hope, the purpose. Some of you today, God's going to complete a healing process of where you've been forgiving yourself, and now God can do the work. But there are some other people that have been angry with God. It wasn't that they were mad at themselves. They didn't blame themselves. Some of you who are here, you blame God. And you were like, God, had you been there, my brother wouldn't have died. So-and-so wouldn't have died. And you're angry with God. Come on, because you need to be able to forgive God and release that out of your heart today. Bad things happen, and you blame God because he had the power to stop it, and he didn't stop it. And you didn't understand why, but God will walk with you even through the pain of that. And he'll help to restore you, and he'll bring an understanding and a compassion and a tenderness in you, and God will transform you through trouble. And I invite you today to just let Jesus do a work in your life. I so commend these who have come. It takes courage to do this, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Some of you have already beat the devil because he was bidding against you. He put reservations in you and doubt in you, and you've already shown yourself a winner and a warrior because you press your way over the opinions of people, over their ideas, you want to be able to meet Jesus in a real way and have his power infused into you, giving you not only the power but the desire. That's how you know that God has come into a human soul. It's when your desires change. Your desire, you can't change your desires on your own. You need the Holy Ghost. He's the best therapist supernaturally to be able to change your desires and then he will give you power. To give you power, he'll give you power. God is God for a reason. And he reminds us that he is God and we are not. There are a few more people. The Holy Spirit is waiting on you to just get up and join this great host that has already come today. Come on, come on. Don't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Don't leave like you came in Jesus' name. 
Before we pray for these, if you're without a church home and if you want to make Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral your new church home, I want to invite you to get up out of your seat and come and make Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral your new church home. Everybody needs a good church home. Everybody needs a place to be planted, rooted, and grounded so that you can grow. So you can grow. Come on and join God's church. Come on. Everybody. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, you need a place to call home. You need a family of believers to be planted in a local church. Some of you, your name is on a roll of a church in another city, but you're in the metro Atlanta area now, and you need a place right here in metro Atlanta. Come on. I hope you realize that this is a house of no nonsense. This is not about foolishness and hype and, and uh, the, the, you know, the latest trend. This place is built on the solidness of God's Word. I've not been granted any editorial privilege to be able to alter this and change its principles and truth. We accept it as the infallible, inerrant Word of God with life-giving principles and truth to be able to transform our lives. This has been my guide for my ministry ever since I've been ministering every single week since 1976. And I've found it to be a great source of strength and power. And it is transformative in its very nature. And I'm deeply grateful to God for the power of the Word of God. It's all that we really have upon which we can build. And it brings security in us based on the instability of the times in which we live. Stretch your hand toward these folks. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this host that has come just to surrender to you. They're responding, Lord God, in their hearts with their feet. They're coming forward as a sacrament that you see. It's a physical evidence saying that they're leaving the place where they have been and coming to the place where you are. And Lord, I pray that you will meet them at the point of the spiritual need that is in their life. Begin to transform every desire on the inside of them and then infuse them with a the power as they open their hearts to you, Lord. Do the redemptive work. Anoint a love within their heart for the Word of God, for prayer, for regular attendance in the house of God that they can build fellowship with fellow saints, Lord Jesus, fellow believers, and be strengthened to be able to live out your will day by day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you allow the Holy Spirit to become their constant companion that will walk with them and talk with them, lead them, and give them an un canny wisdom to know what to do and what not to do. Father, I pray that you will sensitize their voices, their, their ears to your voice. Sensitize them. Sharpen their discernment. Give them a hunger for truth to cause their lives from this day forward to never be the same again. In Jesus' name. And we bless you for these that have come for membership here at Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral. May you teach us to love them as fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reveal to them their gifts, their talents, their abilities to be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And I pray, God, that the blessings of this house may also come upon their houses and may their lives never, ever be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to take you to... We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.